Good evening and welcome to the September 12th, 2013 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz and I will begin by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Mayor David Present. Mr. Here. Present. Here. 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 Present. Thank you. Uh, next, we will move to the public comment period. Is there anyone here who wishes to um, offer public comments? If so, you can come to the podium. Okay. I don't believe we have anyone signed up. So uh, we'll then move on to um, city council announcements. <coughs> um, are there any announcements that uh, folks wish to make on the school committee? I did want to make one announcement myself, uh, and that was uh, to formally announce that uh, I have appointed, uh, formally now appointed the superintendent screening committee, and I wanted to sort of publicly announce the names of the of the um, residents and staff who are serving on that screening committee, which actually had its first meeting, which we'll hear a little bit about later. Um, Alan Bloomgarden of 172 Greenleaf Drive in Florence. Uh, Sharon Carlson, uh, president of the Northampton Association of School Employees. Maria Garcia, who's a kindergarten teacher at Jackson Street School. Tammy McGinnis, 14 Day Avenue, Northampton. Uh, Mark McLaughlin, the business manager. Maureen Moore, who's a guidance counselor at Northampton High School. Uh, Stephanie Pick uh, from the school committee. Uh, Kay Sakvitny from 9 Babery Lane in Florence. Julie Spencer Robinson, who is a sixth grade teacher at JFK Middle School. Kim Stillwell, 14 Conn Street in Northampton. Leslie Wilson, the principal here at JFK Middle School. And Ed Zahowski, the vice chair of the school committee. Uh, so those are the uh, folks, and I want to just publicly thank them for serving and also thank the other um, residents who expressed interest and applied to serve on the committee. Um, and that's my announcement. Thank you. Yes, um, first of all. I'd like to announce that with the beginning of the school year, first of all, welcome to all the students and the teachers and everyone back. Um, I'd like to announce that I'm a, um, as your school committee candidate, I'm not candidate, as your school committee um, at large member, I would, representative, I would like to be invited to come to PTOs if you have any issues that you want to discuss, open houses, and um, also the school councils. I'd like to go again to those to make sure that I'm in touch with the different schools. So if anybody has any needs at the different schools, please contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the recommended actions portion of the agenda. And uh, we have a consent agenda tonight that consists of the approval of minutes of the school committee meeting of August 8th, 2013. We then have a number of contracts. Um, and I'll go through those contracts. United Elevator for $15,972.50. Uh, that's for elevator maintenance and inspections. Clark HVAC services, $17,000 for annual boiler maintenance and inspection. Alston supplies, $5,284.43, which is cleaning supplies for the district. Heinemann Publishing, $9,474.62. Uh, this is uh, K through five instructional materials. All Star Dairy Foods, $100,000. Uh, this is a uh, purchasing, consolidated purchasing for NPS and Smith Voc for milk and dairy products. G Housing, $25,000, another consolidated purchasing uh, to purchase uh, water, fruit drinks, and juice products. Atkins Farm Country Market, uh, $40,000. Uh, this is for produce to support both uh, NPS and uh, Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School Food Service. Lower Pioneer Valley Collaborative, $24,000. Uh, this is the Municipal Medicaid Reimbursement Filing Fee. The Collaborative for Educational Services, or HEC, $9,527. Uh, this is the Annual Membership Fee. And Precise Paving Incorporated, $11,688.50. And these are for some additional charges related to the Bridge Street School drainage system. 
Uh, those are the contracts. The next uh, set of items as part of the consent agenda is the field trip requests. We have Northampton High School cross country team going to Hudson, New Hampshire on October 5th. The cross country team uh, going to Manchester, Manchester, Connecticut on October 12th. The NHS academic team going to New Haven, Connecticut on October 12th. And the Northampton High School chorus going to New York City on November 20th. So those are all of the items that comprise the consent agenda, and I would ask for a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the consent agenda is adopted. Next, we'll move on to reports and recommendations. Uh, and we have a report uh, uh, this evening. This is the uh, annual food service uh, report. And we have uh, Carol DeMauro, who's here from the uh, food services department. And uh, she'll be uh, making this annual report. And then you'll see as part of this, there's also a vote that we are required to take annually as part of our ongoing uh, participation in the National School Lunch Program. So, Carol Turner. Thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, this is our annual report. Last year we served 28,106 breakfasts and 185,923 lunches. This was an increase in the breakfast area of 3,700 uh, breakfasts and a decrease in the lunch area of just over 8,000 lunches. We brought in $69,543 less in income compared to the year before. Out of that money, cash receipts, which include student sales, adult sales, a la carte sales, which we have very little a la carte anymore, that was a decrease of $42,973. And because we served less meals, we also got less USDA reimbursement to the tune of $26,570. Our expenses decreased because we served less meals from $732,683 to $685,973 for a difference of $47,710. One of the decreases was due to the restructuring of the food service office. We had a 35 hour year round principal clerk slash secretary and I changed that to two 20 hour school year positions. And that saved us most of the, uh, the decrease in the uh, expenses. The uh, office seems to be running more smoothly and this way I have at least one other person in the office with me if somebody's out sick. Overall, the program ended with a negative balance. And this is the first time it's ended with a negative balance since FY02. Um, in April of 01, when I first started here, the department had a $118,000 deficit. We ended up building, wiping out the deficit in three years and then building up the account. But we needed to purchase new equipment. We had other expenses. So you can see the um, amount in my revolving account has slowly been going down every year. This year we actually were 36,000 plus in the hole. The city did appropriate 25,000 so in reality, we were 11,000 in the hole. Uh, the city used to subsidize us. From 2005 to 2012, we received no money from the city whatsoever. So this is the first money we've gotten from the city, which was this year. Uh, besides food and supplies, we had a service contract for our point of sale computers. If something happens to one of our point of sale um, units, they will come out right away. They're only in East Hampton and they'll replace it so that we won't have any downtime and we won't have to go back to pencil and paper and checking off the students as they go through the line. We also had repairs and maintenance. Most of this was to my equipment 
and that was $7,562. Things like heating elements and um, problems with the refrigerators, nothing major, but it all adds up and it's to keep the equipment running and in good condition. Um, an accomplishment in FY13 were all the new regulations that came down on July 1st uh, as far as school lunches go. Fruits and vegetables were doubled, the amounts that we had to give the children. Uh, there was now weekly requirements for dark leafy green vegetables, red and orange vegetables, and um, beans. You have to feed the kids beans and spinach and broccoli and beets. Um, at least half of the grains that we serve have to be whole grain. I made an effort to make sure that all our grains were whole grain this year so that we'll be ahead of the curve in two years when it's mandated that all the grains are whole grain. Uh, white milk is now low fat and chocolate milk is totally fat free. The meats and meat alternatives, those range from one to two ounces depending on the age groups. There were also other restrictions that the federal government came up with in uh, covering competitive foods and beverages and um, the government basically wanted to get into the classrooms and they are dictating what you can serve at classroom parties, they're dictating what you can serve at um, sporting events, on the football field, um, basically total control of any locations on the school property. Uh, we, we had a wonderful start to this school year. It was probably the smoothest I've had in 12 years and that was thanks to my wonderful staff and particularly the two women, Debbie and uh, Peggy in my office. They kept telling me to breathe and remain calm. Um, <laughs> We were kind of rushed this year because of Aspen. We didn't know who was in the system until almost last minute, but we got through it. Everybody had their cards, they had their applications, and with the exception of the musical kids that we play in between schools, we made sure everybody got to eat that day and there weren't any problems. All our forms went out the first day of school. They were due back last Friday, and I have mountains of forms in my office, and I have about just under 900 children that qualify for either free or reduced and they're already in our system. Um, speaking of free and reduced, on the next page we have the enrollment back to 2006 all the way up to May of 2013 and you can see how the percentage has gone up over the years as far as free and reduced students. Right now almost 32 percent of the students in the district are either free or reduced. Uh, this year we also installed my school bucks. As of this afternoon, we have 550 parents that have taken advantage of the system. Uh, that's only in one year's time. They're depositing money on their children's accounts. They're also checking to see what their little darlings are eating and uh, if they're eating. So it's almost like Big Brother is watching them. Uh, are there any questions? This is going to sound really bad, but uh, what, do you have a plan in mind for what you can do this year that will minimize that deficit? Well, we, pu come in, um, we pulled away from um, fresh vegetables and we're using more canned and frozen. Um, the prep time and also the vegetables themselves are very expensive and uh, between the droughts and the excess rain uh, you can even see in the grocery stores the prices have skyrocketed. Um, we are buying some local produce. Our produce vendor this year is uh, Atkins so most of our apples will be coming from them along with some of our other produce. Um, we're trying to stay local but we also have to probably go back to canned and frozen. Mr. Bourne? I had a question. I, I saw there's a contract with G Housing for, um, for drinks. I know 
one of the standards that's proving onerous across the state is the juice standard, which is um, no more than four ounces or less for juice. Um, I think some districts across the state, from what I've heard, have decided not to fully comply with the state standards just because um, they're so much in the red. So what has been your approach? Are you, are you going 100% by the state standards, or are you kind of doing what you need to do to kind of stay more in the black, I guess? We're not selling juice. Okay. We only sell um, water and uh, seltzer. Mm -hmm. And that's only here at JFK and at the high school. It is not at the elementary level. Yeah, okay. So yeah. we're staying within the uh, A list. Okay. okay, thanks. Mr. Zahowski. Uh, so the new vendor this year is Atkins. Uh, in the past, we viewed State Street. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And, and another vendor out there, and could be uh, Squash Inc., perhaps. Uh, could you maybe just tell us how the Atkins uh, contract came about being shifted from State Street for people that might want to know? Uh, the prices were substantially lower for Atkins as compared to State Street. We also get some of our produce from PFG. Uh, the things that Atkins can't supply us or we need on a, a short term or very quick turnover, um, we'll get them from PFG. <coughs> um, Squash Inc. we had years ago. They chose not to bid this year. Atkins had called me several years ago and asked if um, I would send them a bid, which I did. And then this year they had the lowest prices. So we're going to try it for this year and see how everything goes so far for the past two weeks, which are first two orders. The produce has been wonderful. Great. Other questions? Yes, Mr. Zahowski. Just following up on uh, what Ms. Minnick said in regards to um, trying to rein in the cost, <clears throat> I know we're going to be taking a vote here on national school uh, participation in the national school lunch program. That binds us to certain regulations. Um, do you feel as though it would be advantageous or at some point to pull out of the program so that uh, the regulations would be less and you may be able to not run in such a deficit? If we pulled out of the program, we could serve anything we wanted. But you would also have to charge all your free and all your reduced, the 275, like you pay, you charge all your paid students. Or you would have to, um, the city would have to pay for their lunches. And right now you're running about 32% of the students are um, free or reduced. So that would be a call on your side whether you want to make it or not without putting you on the spot. So you don't think it would be uh, financially wise to do it as a means to rein in costs? No. Okay. Has 32 percent been, a, um, is that a, a, an average over the past few years? I mean, is it in increase, decline? It's in, in my report. In uh, September 2006, we had 27 percent. And then we've gone up every year. Um, 2010 to 2013, we ran between 31 and 32 percent. So yes, it's slowly going up, but I also saw as I was doing the, um, the applications that some people that were free or directly certified by the state now are paid. So that could mean too that the economy is picking up, more people have better jobs. But Do you think it might also be a push of, of sending the papers out again and again and again until, I mean, we have just more people um, filling them out? Because I remember years ago when it was just a matter of we got them and if we didn't fill them out, then they didn't get filled out. And then there was a real big push. I was just wondering if the increase had been it was in, in correlation to the push for having people sign it whether or not they needed it. I don't think so. Because um, we've used the system where they go out the first day of school and then probably the second week of school after I've gone through the majority of them, I will send out a second batch for those that I haven't gotten. and. Um, then the schools also send out or send some home with the students too. So we send out as many as three different mailings or uh, batches. And I also want to um, commend you for implementing the whole grain prior. I mean, it, it's a wonderful standard that we have to set and, and it's important, so why not start it earlier? And I just want to thank you for that. That was good. Thank you. Yeah, but well, I was just going to comment on something uh, that Mr. Ball was speaking to, and I, I think that um, 
would the increase in fees that we <coughs> had, um, for, a, for example, in athletics, um, we do give breaks to students who um, qualify for free and reduced. And so with the increase in fees, and even with, um, with busing, busing, I think um, more people have signed and filled out those forms, sent them back so that they could kind of take advantage of some of the other subsidies or, Good point. or breaks we offer. So that may be one of the reasons why we're mm -hmm. seeing an increase. They also use it for SAT exams. I guess they get free exams for that. And also for AP courses, the fees that are associated with those if they're free or reduced. I also have one more question. Um, you having fat-free chocolate milk, but um, low-fat white milk is there a reason that we're not serving whole um, fat-free white milk? Also, I mean, we had skim before, mm -hmm. and uh, nobody was taking it. And I was having you throw it out because it went out of date. Ah, uh, okay. I would be happy to get it back in if I have a request for it. But it wasn't. Popular. It wasn't popular. Okay, thanks. Um, are there any other questions or comments? I mean, this is not, this is what we're seeing here is a trend that's happening in school districts all across the state. I know Smith Vocational has the same, ha had the same challenges in terms of a deficit. Um, and, you know, the, the state is setting the bar higher, which I think is good uh, for nutrition, but as, as is often the case, they tend to raise the bar but not raise the funding that they provide. Um, so here we are, and uh, just to clarify what you said earlier too, the about the city funding or not funding, we basically run it like a revolving fund, like we run lots of revolving funds in the city. It's a city, it's a city operation, but it basically has to run on the profits that it generates, yes, uh, all the all fees my, that it takes in, all um, my salaries, all yeah. my food, all my repairs, uh, the majority of my equipment come out of this money. Mm -hmm. And the same, I mean, we have the similar thing for solid waste. We have it for water, sewer, similar kinds of cost centers like that. So, um, so I guess we, it's one of those things we almost have to kind of look at that structure possibly going forward if it's just not going to be sustainable. Because I hate to think we're going to stop serving certain kinds of nutritious foods or moving away from those foods. So it may just be we have to talk about that um, moving forward that we're just going to have to make a commitment to make sure. Have you seen uh, as you've moved to some of these are kids actually taking all these vegetables that are being offered? Are, we, are they actually availing themselves of them? Are they? On the elementary level they haven't put on a tray and they aren't huge portions. They're little portions for them to try. And I am hoping that they're getting used to trying them. Here at JFK in the high school, we put the bowls out for the students to help themselves. So I know there's some students that absolutely love broccoli, so they take double portions of broccoli. And some like certain fruits. We usually have two or three different kinds of fruits out. So they help themselves as they go down the line. And that has been uh, huge. OK. OK, thank you. For any other questions or comments from mm -hmm. school committee? Um, so uh, thank you very much for that report. Um, and then again, as part of uh, as part of tonight's discussion about the um, about the food services department, uh, we do have an annual vote that we need to take with regard to continuing our participation in the national school lunch program. And so I would uh, entertain a motion on that for purposes of discussion. So moved. So there's a motion to continue our participation in the national school lunch program. Second. Seconded. Um, did you have a question about that? Any questions about that? Okay, great. Um, okay, so all those in favor of that vote, uh, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the vote is, uh, is positive. Um, so we'll move forward now to our next presentation. Uh, and this is a presentation by the Prevention Coalition. And uh, Marissa Hebel is here. Karen Jarvis Vance PowerPoint. is here. She's going to be Stephanie running Stephanie Pick is going to advance for us. I might. Uh... You guys this 
So I'm Marisa Hebel. I'm the coordinator of the Northampton Prevention Coalition. Um, as you know, the coalition is housed within the Northampton Public Schools. We're um, funded entirely by two federal grants, um, and our primary charge is to reduce substance use amongst youth in Northampton. Um, so every two years, we do this very big, intensive survey with teenagers in Northampton, and we come and present the results to you. Uh, because you guys have a full agenda and um, our primary um, goals are to reduce youth substance use, we're going to give you the quick and dirty on youth substance use in Northampton tonight. This survey has a lot of other information that we would love to provide you with at another time. There are lots of school climate questions on the survey, sexual health, um, some food and fitness questions, community, you name it. There's a lot on this survey. So tonight is youth substance use. You can advance. So one more time, Stephanie, thanks. So we hear a lot about um, teen substance use as just a rite of passage. We all did it, we all turned out fine. Um, there are lots of reasons why it's important to invest in prevention. Um, most importantly, the teen brain's not finished developing until about the mid-20s. Um, and early substance use has an impact that can be long-lasting. Um, we know that kids who are regular drug and alcohol users um, have all sorts of negative outcomes. Um, like lower GPAs and higher rate, rates of delinquency and are more likely to become addicted later. So it's, it's important to put a lot of money and in prevention into prevention. So like I said, this survey, we do it every two years with 8th, 10th, and 12th grade students. You can jump in if you want. Um, we surveyed in this past spring. Um, the same survey, the Prevention <coughs> Assessment Survey, is used in all the Hampshire County schools as well as many other communities in the state and um, across the country. So um, this is our 30-day substance use. This is for all the substances that we ask about on the survey. The reason why we use a 30-day measure is uh, that gives us the be that's the best indicator of a regular use. So you stay on that for just a second. Oh, sorry. Go back, yeah, go back to that. that. Go back one more. Yeah. So our primary targets are uh, reducing alcohol use, marijuana use, and prescription drug use. This survey breaks out prescription drugs into four categories, so amphetamines, sedatives, tranquilizers, and other narcotics. Um, our two primary targets are alcohol and marijuana, as those are the two top substances that are most widely used by young people in Northampton. We're also looking at what our eighth graders are telling us, what our tenth graders are telling us, and what our seniors are telling us, just to clarify. You can ask me questions during, too, if anybody has any. This is just breaking out, so you can see a little bit um, easier what uh, by grade, and this is percent of students. And regular alcohol use, like I said, means having used within the last 30 days, which indicates regular use. Binge drinking is an important measure for us to keep. Um, so binge drinking is a, for a female having four or more drinks, and for a man having five, or, for a male having five or more drinks. That's the point where most people start to see negative consequences. So these are our students that we can assume are having negative consequences from their alcohol use. This is an important number to, for us to see going down. <laughs> but so this is a, a good number for us to know. This is where our students are telling us that they are accessing alcohol. So this is how they're getting alcohol. There's a lot on that slide. Most of our students are getting it from social sources. So our older students are getting it from someone they know who is over 21. And I'll just say here that this is the primary way that we gather data, but we gather data in lots of other ways. So this spring, we uh, focus grouped with um, out outgoing Northampton seniors and sophomores uh, to get survey data can tell us a lot, but it doesn't tell us the entire picture. So it doesn't tell us who students are getting it from, or um, if they're getting it from siblings, are they getting it from cousins, are they getting it from the same person every time. So we did focus group students and got, they gave us a lot of information, which was great. So this just breaks out uh, social sources, um, seem to be our, the primary way that our students are, are obtaining alcohol. Someone they know over 21, someone they know under 21. This is where our students are drinking. This is helpful to get all this information because it helps us to target our strategies so we can look at what we're actually doing to reduce substance use. Uh, and this is also another reason why um, one of our primary targets is going to be preventing and intervening with unsupervised underage parties, which as you see the top line is I drank at my home or someone else's home without parent permission, which students are also telling us from focus groups that 
the majority of drinking is happening at unsupervised underage parties. And so that will be one of our uh, primary focuses in the coming year. Um, uh, yeah, go back. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just sitting here kind of flabbergasted. That and I'm moving kind of fast because we're short on time, but yes. I'm just, I'm amazed that there's quite as much use at home with parents' permission. <laughs> Is that just me? <laughs> no, we're together on that. Okay. We are. We are together on that. Um, so we're at someone else's home with their parents. Right. Right. Uh, right. Um, I'm yes. Just baffled. I would agree with you. Is it possible that that includes like there's a special family dinner and you're allowed to have a half a glass of wine as opposed to like I'm sitting here and having a hard drink with my parents? So <laughs> I will go back to confirm this, but I believe the question asks where did you drink and where did you drink not including a sip, just a sip, not including a religious um, observance. It clarifies okay. so that it doesn't include someone who may have had a sip on a Shabbos or something like that. So um, yeah. So drinking at someone else's home with their parents' permission or drinking at home with my parents' permission um, is also something that we're looking at and trying to target. Our, we were also also surprised. Anything on that. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've focused a lot on the parent social norms campaign and on the safe homes directory, which are two interventions that are targeted directly at that issue. Right, which that she brings up a good point. So. And I'm just going to flip the script a little bit because at, so at home, at someone else's home, which is the third one down with their parents' permission, so that does look like it's 36-ish percent of our seniors. Most of our senior parents are not allowing kids to drink at home. So I just want to be careful that we don't je overgeneralize. So it is something we're paying attention to. We were surprised. Um, that's more than we anticipated. But still, most of our parents, and by far most of the parents of teenagers in Northampton, are not serving to kids. They're not allowing kids to drink in their home. And it is one of the reasons why we're targeting parents as one of our prime I suspects. I just to say also the, um, the eighth graders at the home with the parents' permission mm -hmm. is, is incredible. The percentage there, eighth graders. Mm, at home with parents' permission. Eighth graders. Mm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's a really high percentage, I think, for eighth graders. You can skip. You can go. Yep. So this year we actually added some questions. We wanted to know, so we hear a lot, this is, teen drinking is just a rite of passage. So we asked students what negative consequences they're having from a related to their drinking. Uh, and this is what they told us. <coughs> I'll also add, so at the, at the, all, the side is problems at school or work, um, and I think that, I don't know that all students can directly connect their drinking with any problems they may have at school, but if they did have a hangover on a Saturday night that they weren't feeling so great on a Sunday, doing schoolwork on a Sunday may not have been their top priority. So I'm just going to add that in, that may be underreported, the problems at school or work. Well, the percentage was also similar to the drunk at the school and the work, so it might have been some of the kids saying, well, if I was drunk, I must have been having problems. Hopefully they're making that connection. <laughs> so this is just breaking out marijuana use. It's a little easier to see by grade. This is also where students are telling us they're accessing marijuana. This one actually, so we were really happy to have added this one as well. Um, so a lot of students are telling us they're having negative consequences, consequences related to their marijuana use. So we were very happy that we added this question. Um, particularly, and another one I'll, I'll also just add, so at the bottom is doing poorly on a test or at school or work, but at the top is feeling tired, groggy, and unmotivated. And the third is, is difficulty remembering things. I mean, these are all skills we need. Feeling motivated and remembering things are skills we need for school. Um, so I think these are important to look at. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we have these numbers. This one surprised us. So seniors are now driving after using marijuana more than they are driving after drinking. One thing we do know about any substance for adolescents, particularly for adolescents, but for anyone, so the less harm that we associate with something, the more likely we are to do it. Um, and the more that we believe our community is in favor of something, the more likely we are to do it. This is particularly true for adolescents. Adolescents are getting a lot of messaging around marijuana. It's been a very changing climate in our state and in our country. Um, and this driving after using marijuana, it really tells us that 
they're not seeing harm. We've done a really good job in the public health field of reducing drinking and driving rates and of letting kids know that the adults in their community don't think it's okay and getting messaging to them. We need to double our efforts when it comes to kids believing that the, there's harm associated with marijuana, regardless of what we think about marijuana as medicine. Um, kids aren't getting messaging that we don't want kids to use, um, which is a message we need to send home. How does legalization in Washington and Colorado for recreational use affecting your attitudes in terms of what you saw in the streets? Because, I mean, it's medicinal now, but I think most kids will draw the line and say it's medicinal use. And yeah. Use. Well, therefore, it must be okay. Yes. So this, that's interesting. So it's been a tricky time to be in youth substance use during decriminalization and legalization. Uh, so during focus groups, we asked students what they thought about legalization and what they thought. Um, and they told us that, um, so this is snippets. I'm giving you quotes. I'm not giving you survey data. So I want you to know, take into account, this is one or two students' opinions who happen to speak up on this topic, um, that uh, dispensaries in town that right now marijuana was not difficult for them to get but that dispensaries may just make it so that they can access better marijuana what we're seeing in other states is that access has gone up youth rates have gone up um, we don't want to get into a big debate about that now but so I think it's something we have to pay really close attention to and as a community we can keep sending the message home that we don't want kids to use marijuana. That it, there is harm related to brain development as far as marijuana goes. There is harm with driving after using, and we have to get really, we have to get really explicit and redouble our efforts as well. But it's certainly a community effort. I don't know if you want to add anything there. So non-medical prescription drug use. So this is a student using a prescription who does not have a prescription, using a prescription drug that they do not have a prescription for. We have seen a slight uptick. First of all, I want you to know this is on a 30, the, the y-axis is up out of 30. It was, it's very small. The, there are very small numbers for all prescription drug use. Um, it's very hard to see if it was on a 100-point scale. Um, but the, what we have seen an uptick in amongst our seniors is um, using ADHD med medications to study. Um, so this is getting one from a friend or buying one from someone that you know. So we've seen a slight uptick. I do want to say most of our seniors are not using med medications to study. Almost 90% are not. But it's something we're paying attention to because that is an in that's an increase for us. Uh, this summer we had a re uh, planning retreat <coughs> that included over 30 um, community members, um, people from the schools, um, the vice principal. Uh, school members, law enforcement from all over the community. Um, and we talked about what we're going to do. And so we shared this data with them. And um, we're in, in, in planning. But that number was interesting to us. And students also um, backed this up that, for the most part, students are getting the stimulant medications from someone who has a prescription. Um, and so we're really looking at um, parents who are who may be giving the medication to their older children just to take on their own, um, just a little bit more parental monitoring. Um, there seem to be a lot of strategies for reducing access. How many people filled out this survey? So for ooh, it's at the 100. beginning, 400 almost 500, almost 500 students. What, what, like, I'm, I'm just wondering, like. When I look at this percentage of how many seniors, like how many, so do you know how many seniors filled the? So it was over 100 seniors. Um, I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head. The percentages are, we know that they're representative of, of the community. So the, of, I'm sorry, of the population. So that when I say that 20% of seniors are telling us they got prescription drugs from a friend, I can say that that translates to our entire population. Does that make sense? How do we know that? So because it's a big enough sample, so our sample is big enough that it's a census sample. Um, Yes. So this is just show you some trends. This is the fourth data point uh, that we have for using this survey. Um, and I would just wanted to show you how things are changing over time. Um, we're seeing some good downward um, trends with our eighth and tenth grade students um, and our seniors. Our seniors in our focus groups um, it helped explain this a little bit. Um, and so we're starting to look at age um, appropriate prevention and intervention for parents and all of us. Um, some seniors talked about parents switching to harm reduction messaging for some seniors as opposed to abstinence messaging. So as opposed to having a policy of you're not allowed to use anymore, which they, some seniors said was very clear when they were juniors. When they became seniors, some parents were switching messaging to uh, if you're going to use, here's how I, how I want you to use SMART. 
um, which for a teen, um, Teens think uh, very black and white. The gray area is very difficult for many teenagers to negotiate. So that may have something to do. So we're looking at really age appropriate prevention. Binge drinking, we're very happy to see that this is declining in our eighth and 10th graders. And we're hoping And I just to wanted to point out yeah. too, we were funded in 2009. Oh yeah, Sorry. So you can see, important to see. what's happening. Marijuana use, we kind of expect to be a little bit all over the map right now. Um, frankly, the fact that it was leveled out with our sophomores and our eighth grade students, we were happy to see. Uh, right after decriminalization in 2009, we, so 2008 happened in the fall of, I'm sorry, in the fall of 2008 is when decriminalization took place and we did see an uptick of our sophomores and seniors that following spring. Um, so we're, we were glad that we didn't see a corresponding uptick with um, marijuana's medicine legalization this past fall. So this is a really simple way. We go through this very lengthy process, step-by-step -step process to determine what strategies we're using, um, putting together logic models. Um, this is just a snippet of what we're doing. Those are our priority substances. We have interventions and um, prevention programming going on at all levels. And that is really just a snapshot at the bottom level of what we'll be doing through the, the upcoming year. And Karen, I don't know if you want to make quick mention about the ESPER program that started this year. So I don't, if you're interested, I can give you the data from that if you would like. So you may remember I was here in the spring to talk to you about ESPER, which stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. We did a universal screening with our entire ninth grade. So we have, um, which basically we administered a very basic screen to them and then did some um, motivational interviewing and talking to our students about their use if they had used. The first part of the screen just asked them if they've used in the last year and if they screen positive on that they move on to the second part of the screen which asks them a few simple questions which are predictive of problem use. So we had 229 total freshmen. Um, out of that entire group, you may remember we, we came here, we talked about it, we sent letters home to parents. Parents were given the opportunity to see the screen and to opt their children out if they so wished. So 229 letters went home. Out of 229, seven were opted out by their parents. So we screened 200 and, what's that, 22 freshmen. Um, one opted themselves out. That was it. So out of that, 34 of our freshmen had a positive pre-screen, which is right on line with our data. A pretty small percentage of our freshmen stated that they'd used substances in the last year. Out of that, we, didn't, we weren't really good about noting it, so we learned something for next this year to do. Um, we tried to note what substances they were using. Um, 16 were alcohol and six were marijuana where we noted and zero were other, which again is right in line with our survey data of what we know how kids are using at what age. Um, of those that screened in, so that were currently using or had used in the last year, only five had a positive craft screen, meaning they were positive for problem use. One of those was already under care, was already identified and under care. The other four were referred to our in-house adjustment counselor for a further assessment. We called the parents of all four of those students with the knowledge of those students that we were doing it. And all in all, that was a really positive experience. Every parent we called was grateful for the call and grateful to, for the referral to the uh, in-house adjustment counselor. We did 24 brief interventions, which means a, a longer talk with students about their use. Most of those were around the C question, which was the car question. Most of our positives on the second part of the screen were about riding in a car with someone that was under the influence. So most of our talking was with kids about negotiating, mostly with family members that had been drinking about how they're going to get home from wherever they had been. We had some really, really great conversations with kids about that. Um, I wanna say we, we did a post test because I was in the copy room in the main office when one of the teachers who has a freshman came up to me and said, I wanna tell you something interesting. My son, after the screening was done, went to the nurse for a different problem for the first time in his entire school career had never gone to see the school nurse. 
So she and I were wondering if maybe his perception of the nurse had changed based on going through this screening, more than just checking your vision and your, but actually having a conversation. So we did a post test with the students. We surveyed all the students um, at the end of the year, asked them after meeting with the nurse, are you, um, do you feel you're more or less likely to use alcohol or other drugs? 68% uh, of the kids said about the same. 5% said more likely. But 27% of the kids surveyed said they were less likely to use alcohol or other drugs after meeting with the nurse, which I thought was a great, a great number. Um, let's see, and the other question we asked them, because we always get asked this, whether it's a survey or any other intervention we, we do, how honest were you with the nurse? And they were given uh, a range between not at all honest, honest some of the time, mostly honest, and completely honest. So they could, they could cop out with mostly honest. 9% said not at all, all honest, 5% were honest some of the time, 13% were mostly honest, 73% of adolescents said they were completely honest with the nurse. So all in all, this was an extremely productive and um, rewarding experience for all of us that were involved and we do intend to keep it going to the best of our ability. Uh, just, I'll make, just make a couple of points Karen mentioned, and I don't know if it's come up in any of your minds, but um, uh, we often get asked, how do you know students are telling the truth on the surveys? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just reiterate what I've probably said here before. Um, we have a few catches in the surveys to make sure that we um, can be confident in the results. So we know that when surveys are given in a way that is anonymous, confidential, and voluntary, that people feel the most comfortable um, being honest and our surveys are, are all three of them, have all three of those characteristics. Um, and uh, there is, so that honesty question is actually the last question on this survey as well. And apparently research shows that the way people answer that question is usually reflected in the way they were on the survey. So if someone said they were not, which is just funny to me, but if someone said they were not honest on the survey, that survey is not counted. Um, and then there are a few inconsistent, there's also a false drug on the survey, so, um, if a student said they used that drug, that survey is not counted. And then um, the survey is caught for inconsistencies. So if a student answered in one question that they um, never drank before, and then another question said they drank 30 days of the last month, then that survey is also not counted. So I just wanted to mention that in case that was floating around in anyone's head. One other thing I'd also like to mention is we are starting um, SAD chapters. We have just hired a new youth engagement coordinator. Um, she, Ananda is finishing her school counseling degree at UMass this December. She previously worked with in-school suspension students at Smith Vocational. Um, and she'll be with us and she'll be um, charged with starting, um, doing all of our youth engagement. Uh, one of the things we know is that youth, when their attitudes are favorable to substance use, they're more likely to use. And so um, the SAD chapter is not only going to be looking at substance use issues, but so SAD used to be students against drunk driving and now it's students against destructive decisions. And the SAD chapter can decide what they'd like to do. Um, they can decide, some SAD chapters do texting and driving uh, one month, and then the next month they do seat belt wearing, and the next month they may do substance abuse prevention, but it's really a positive, um, healthy choice uh, club for kids. So she's gonna be starting that at the high school. Um, Safe Homes, uh, our Safe Homes program is, is up and running. Our Parent Social Norms campaign will be there, and um, lots more. You can click to the next slide. Yeah. Hmm. It's not doing anything. Maybe. Hmm. <laughs> there's only one more slide, or there's a couple more slides, but it's okay. I can read it to you. Uh, actually, the last slide might be interesting to you guys. Is actually what you can do to help. What school committee can do. Um, you can come to our coalition meetings. You might want to click on system preferences in the middle. Oh, but that's okay. Mm, alrighty then. Um, you can attend events. You can talk about the coalition. You can access us for information. There you, now you go, go ahead. One more time. That should be going on its own, but you might have to keep clicking. You can keep going. It's not going. Keep clicking. I guess you have to keep clicking. Um, so seek us out um, for information. Like I said, that uh, the survey has a lot more information than just substance use, and we'd be happy to share it with you. Um, uh, yeah, just please, just my office. I share Karen, an office with Karen at the high school, so please uh, get in touch. The award. 
Oh, Karen would like to know that we are finalists for a GOT Outcomes Award, which is a national award. Um, because we're seeing such nice um, outcomes with our substance use, uh, we are actually a national finalist for an award right now. So we're excited about that. Yeah. Do you have a question about cigarette use? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I just was looking at the CDC prevalence data, and it's, you know, it seems like our kids almost make it. But then cigarettes go up to 20%, which, is, which tracks the national 19% number. And even with alcohol use, um, 12 or more drinks in the year previous year is 51%. So again, our kids almost make it, but then they seem to track the general population. I'm just mm -hmm. wondering about, in your targets, cigarette use was not one of the ones there. Right. But I think cigarettes are one of the most destructive health habits, probably because you're going to die down the road. Right, so so our funding, so we are we are funded to reduce alcohol, marijuana, and um, and prescription drugs. But we have noticed, especially with our seniors, that there is an uptick in tobacco, and so we're paying attention. Karen, you want to say something about the marijuana correlation? Well, yeah, I mean, we have seen, and this is nationally as well, that the youth tobacco use has kind of gone on the same trajectory as the marijuana use. Often they're used together or mixed together the way that they're smoked, so that does not surprise us. And although we're not funded to work on that, we have, um, in the past, we had an 84 chapter at Smith Vocational, which is still active. And we did have one at Northampton High School, which is something we may consider um, engaging in again. And eight, the 84, it rep, it's an old number, actually. It represented the 84% of kids that choose not to use tobacco. Um, and they do a lot of anti-tobacco type activities. So we, we, we will be looking at that. And there's actually a lot to be learned from what the, the, the successes that the tobacco has had in, in terms with other, with other substances. So we are paying attention. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you both. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you, Karen. <coughs> Okay, so we'll just uh, get the tech stuff shut down and move on to the um, next item on the agenda, and that is the business manager's report. So Thank I'll you. turn it over to Mr. McLaughlin. A couple noteworthy items that have happened, just for your benefit and the general public. Uh, we've closed out the FY13 year. We're preparing and uploading and getting ready to post uh, our budget for the FY14 year in the unit system. The annual DESI report, or Department of Education and Secondary Education uh, end of the year report, it's in progress right now. This report is very important because this is the report that drives our Chapter 70 funding. Um, that needs to be filed uh, by the end of the month. The uh, maintenance department, uh, they've done many projects over the summer to improve our buildings. Uh, I'm hoping to get a list for you to share with you so you know what had happened during the summer for the physical appearances around the, around the district. And the district has just crossed over to the new student data information system. It's, the software is called Aspen. Um, training was provided uh, early earlier in August for our key personnel and there will be ongoing training as we continue to put student data in that system. Um, I won't go through the contracts because uh, the mayor has read through all of those uh, for us earlier. Uh, the financial statement that's in your packet that you have, um, that's how our year has ended uh, as of June 30th. Uh, the report captures all the expenses paid for fiscal FY13. There are some areas in the budget that are under budget and there are some areas in the budget that are over. Um, I will uh, come back to you in October with some details of some of those larger areas so you can understand the fluctuation in the flow that has happened in, some er in, in those particular areas. Uh, the student information, one other thing I forgot to tell you was uh, this new system will be the system that will be reporting our October 1st student data to the Department of Education. So we will be using the Aspen system and uh, that new system loading up and going directly to the Department of Education. Um, a lot of other, a lot of other uh, districts have software that loads up. We have the ability uh, to work that through in the Aspen software. Um, 
the maintenance I talked about, food service. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, as part of Carol's report, last year she went through a lengthy process uh, to get us an additional, doesn't sound like a lot, but six cents per meal allowance because we complied with certain guidelines under the USDA requirements and that was figured in and captured as part of her uh, revenues uh, in her particular uh, revolving account. The uh, FY14 capital planning process, uh, just so you know, we have completed that. Um, we've done a two-year capital planning process that happened last year and I've listed out some of the uh, approved projects that came out of that capital planning. Both Mr. Sahousi and myself are school department representatives on that committee where we take part in making recommendations to the mayor uh, along with uh, six or seven other individuals that are on that committee representing other city departments. Uh, so we'll be planning for our FY15 capital projects and that's what will be coming up in October. There's four or five meetings that we'll be attending. And finally, the FY14 budget process. Um, as soon as we get the official closing through the MUNIS process, um, I will be giving you FY14 financial statements. And I'm hoping by the meeting in October, you will be able to see the first quarter financials uh, coming to you for the current year we're in. And that's it. Okay. Um, is there a uh, personnel report this month? Yes, also in your, in your packet, there's a very large personnel <laughs> report, <laughs> probably one of the larger ones that you have seen. Um, obviously, we've had a lot of changes of staff throughout the district. We've had some realignment, uh, a, a significant realignment of our special education program. Uh, we've had a, a number of teachers retire um, under the portion that says separation, but the new hires are uh, replacing uh, vacancies, current teachers who have uh, retired, and you can see all the names that are listed there. Um, you also, we also have a number of promotion and transfers that have happened where maybe last year the teacher was a, a full-time teacher at the high school. They could have been now split between the middle school and the high school. So we also have to recognize those because they could be doing different duties in those other schools. And I just want to, can I just clarify for, for just public information, those hires, I was just, just looking at the list, nearly all of them, I think, are being run through the city's HR department in terms of uh, the whole application process and, and those uh, processes. Um, just want to confirm that. Yes, yes. When, when, th when these positions are open, they're posted uh, through the HR department. We post them on school spring. So when these positions are advertised, everything's done electronically, they are collected, and once the closing date is made on any of these positions, then the hiring process begins. Okay. Just wanted to make sure, to clarify that. That's correct. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Any other, uh, that's the personnel report, so we'll now move on to the superintendent's report. I have some activities that we've been involved in since uh, the opening of school and around the opening of school. Um, first of all, we had an administrative leadership team meeting. Uh, it was a retreat toward the end of August that uh, we put together with all of the administrators to talk about the things that we felt were most important for the district. Um, we looked at professional development plan and we worked on that as to what that would look like for the year. Um, in terms of both professional development for the administrators and uh, teachers, ESP workers, and everyone else we can think of. Because we do feel very strongly that professional development is important for all of us. Um, I might also add that I always um, try to stress the importance for school committee members to also be involved in professional development. And you do have a conference coming up um, the, Nash, the, uh, the state conference, which I believe is in early November this year. I haven't seen the information on it, but it's yearly. It's MASC, MASS, and I would urge you to attend that. 
um, I did for many, many years with board members, and I think it's an important thing to do. And it's very informational and very helpful to school committee members. So when I talk about professional development, I talk across the board and the importance for all of us to be engaged in it. We also had, as part of that leadership, um, the, a workshop with Michael Morris, um, who's uh, Director of Evaluation Assessment with the Amherst School District. He did some work with us in terms of DDMs and looking at how the teacher evaluation system and the new things we need to have in place for the department. So he was very helpful to us. Uh, we felt that uh, he did a great job and that we had a better understanding of how to come up with, with the uh, district determined measures. Um, we also invited the school committee to join us one evening um, and I thought that that was a productive uh, session as did the other members of the administrative team because they had an opportunity to talk with all of the school committee members about what they would be looking for in a new superintendent and they felt very good about the reception that they received uh, from the school committee members in terms of listening to their ideas and their concerns. So I do want to thank the school committee members for joining us that evening. We proceeded to have a new teacher orientation and this I understand was one of the bigger ones we've had in this district. Uh, we had a number of people come on Tuesday, uh, August 27th. These are people new to the districts or people hired halfway through last year. Um, it was a meeting with administrators and an opportunity to meet other new teachers in the district and um, we included a bus tour. Um, in which uh, Glenn Agna, the principal of Jackson Street, I think for the second year, um, provided an opportunity for all the new people to get on a bus and they visited every school um, in Northampton and I think with a, with a running commentary on that. And I think that was uh, very useful. Um, so I think that was enjoyed by all. And then they were able to spend time with principals uh, in their schools for the rest of the day. Uh, opening day was uh, August 28th. We had a welcome back, which I appreciate the mayor joining us to do that on behalf of the school committee. Um, we had an introduction of the administrative leadership team, um, including myself, um, and it was very interesting to see everyone in the auditorium, much larger group than I'm usually addressing, so it was great. Um, and then we offered the mandatory trainings that are required by the Department of Education, the Health Department, et cetera. Um, and then there were faculty and other meetings in the schools for the rest of the day and the following day, staff development. Um, students returned on September 3rd um, and um, I thought it was a very successful opening. Um, there's always the bumps in the road and each school I'm sure had those. But I judge successful openings as to how many phone calls I get in a crisis. I didn't get any. So to me that was successful. The other thing I never do on opening day is I do not visit schools. My feeling is that principals have enough happening in their schools without the so-called boss showing up and seeing how things are going. I did go out the following two days and I was able to visit all the schools and, and principals and other people were very welcoming, met a lot of the teachers, ESPs, had a good time, uh, even though it took me two um, different attempts to find Ryan School, but I did <laughs> find it. So Ryan Street was, uh, was one that was hard for me to locate or originally. Um, and then this Monday was the first day for kindergarten students. And um, we have more than usual. I might add, it appears that we have increases in all of our schools. We'll know for sure when, the, when we shake this down and October 1 is the count for the year for us with student enrollment. But I, it appears as though we have more students in all of the schools at this point. Um, kindergarten got off to a great start. Um, there were some tears, mainly from parents. <laughs> Otherwise, it was successful. <coughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about Park, and I want to recognize uh, Barbara Solo, the reporter for the Gazette. She did an outstanding job with the article on Park testing. Uh, it was very thorough and very extensive. Um, we are one of the districts been chosen to participate in the field testing for PARC, and PARC is the replacement test for MCAS. Um, right now, there are about two-thirds of the districts in Massachusetts who are being asked to participate in the field test. That's 15 percent of the students in grades 3 through 11. All of our schools, except one, will be involved in either math or English language arts. 
or both, and for either the performance assessment, which is in March or April, or the end of the year test, which is May, June. And of those schools, one will use paper and the others will be online. And there will only be two classes in each of those schools um, selected to participate. Um, the negative is, of course, more testing. Um, but I think the positives outweigh that. Uh, I see the positives that PARC is a more in-depth test, which will measure more advanced writing, uh, critical thinking skills, and other college and career ready um, skills, which I think is uh, much better than what MCAS does currently. Um, the other pluses is this district will have an opportunity to see what the questions are like um, and how well our students do on those questions before it counts. This is a, a pilot year, a field test, so it does not count either against students or against the district. And of course the other plus is some of our students for the first time will have the experience of taking an online test. There is a skill to that. I think it's very important. Um, so I'm very pleased that we have been selected um, to a small degree to participate in it. Um, the actual um, date for implementation across the state for PARC, uh, and this does take the vote of the um, Department of Education still, would be the 2014-2015 school year. And um, speaking of PARC, and MCAS um, at your October meeting. I expect that we will have the spring results of the MCAS test and we'll be presenting that to you that evening. Um, I've met with the DSAC team. Um, they've been helping our district and Bridge Street School specifically and we've been invited to participate in their regional network meeting regarding data, um, how to collect it, how to analyze it, interpret it, and how to use it for student improvement. So I've asked principals in all the schools to look to putting together school teams to be attending um, this workshop. Uh, I was very impressed with the team. It's led by um, Donna Harlan, who used to be in this district as assistant superintendent. Um, she's very knowledgeable and very helpful. And other team members who were with her um, when we met um, last Friday, I thought were extraordinary. So I'm sure that this workshop will be well worth attending. Um, I've also asked principals to gather school safety requests for possible inclusion in the capital planning process. I've talked with Mark about that. Uh, it's beginning to take um, shape at this point and some of the things that principals are, are, have expressed to me, they do have a list, they're going over it again. Uh, cameras and outside lighting, uh, walkie talkies, those sorts of things. We have had some vandalism um, outside of the schools. Um, not by our students, at least we don't think so, um, but we're looking at possible outside lighting and cameras to really help with that issue, um, cut down on the vandalism. Um, I might also mention that um, as part of the capital improvement over the three years, I believe there was a technology plan. Um, this would be the third year. We certainly would be looking for funding of that because this last um, amount of money for the technology plan would actually be the money to buy the equipment, the hardware, for our students in the schools. And we will be needing that certainly for the park testing. Um, but even more importantly, I think we really needed in terms of what we need to do in our classrooms educationally in the integration of technology into our curriculum. Um, I think there needs to be um, a lot of help with that here and I think that this uh, this proposal for the next round of capital improvements, um, capital planning would be very important. So I'm certainly um, endorsing that. And um, last but not least, um, we will be sending out a request for proposals for legal counsel for the Northampton Public School District. Our contract with our current attorney expired on June 30th and until we have a new one um, um, selected, which is done by the school committee, um, that person in that firm will be in place, but it's time to go out for bid again this year. And that's all I have unless you have questions. I do on that legal mm -hmm. one. Um, mm -hmm. Are we talking about labor negotiations attorney or are we talking about an attorney that's on retainer? We're talking about whatever we need for legal counsel. So, because we had, I thought we had two contracts, both of them expired? I believe they both expired on June 30th. 
So you're telling me you had one on a retainer and one on labor negotiations. Okay, thank you. But I believe the retainer was, I, I believe that was removed, but I'm not. Uh, uh, and I don't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. but we can certainly research I'll that. certainly research yeah. it and we'll be going There was we'll a local attorney yeah. that was on retainer, but I believe that that, I believe the previous superintendent may have um, ended yeah, that. I'm not, I'm not sure yeah. how frequently we utilized the services, mm -hmm. whether having some paying the retainer was a cost effective way for us to handle our business. Mm -hmm. But it would be nice to, mm -hmm. the, the point in separating the two was that we had someone to do contracts that weren't uh, collective bargaining type things mm -hmm. and also to handle a litigation for mm -hmm. anything that we might have had. We do have another attorney that's actually a special education attorney. I'm well aware of that. that yes. Right. Yes. So, but this was for other litigation mm -hmm. or any other kinds of mm -hmm. contracts or any mm -hmm. other, just general education and yes. related questions just to get a quick opinion right. or something so that we didn't have to call the labor attorney. Yes. So it was kind of a right. Division of labor. Uh huh. Well. Yes. And well. <laughs> In my previous district, we had three attorneys, and we used them for three different reasons. Um, and we had uh, two of those on retainer and one not. So we will look at the needs of the district and see what we want to put out for a proposal. But um, I think that it's really time that you look again in terms of bidding, uh, I'm sorry, the proposal um, process in terms of what we need here for legal counsel. Ms. Peck. A question on the park testing. So this is a pilot year where some of our classes are, are um, using this test, but it's not a replacement for the MCAS this year for them. Those children, those the students in those classes are actually taking both this year, is that correct? It is a decision of the superintendent as to whether that's true or not. And if you uh, excuse uh, any of the same grade level or subject matter in a school, you have to exclude them all. The problem with doing that um, is, number one, there's a gap in your data, uh, and it ties into teacher evaluation, et cetera. Um, and also, for 10th grade, you really can't excuse them because that's the year that determines whether they're going to graduate or not. Um, I've talked about that with the administrators, and um, frankly, I've asked to hear more from them, but I'm leaning toward the fact that we will not excuse. Um, I just think it's too important that we have that information. The downside is it's additional test time, um, but at least it's limited, and I think there are more pros to it than cons. Just two follow-up questions on that. It sounded like the testing was kind of in sync with the timing for the MCAS. So it's, it's a lot of testing all at once for those. There's a window of which it includes some of the time for MCAS. That's correct. And it would be up to the principals in each building to figure out how to do this. There's also um, a potential problem in terms of technology um, because we don't have labs per se that can accommodate full classes. So that doubles the time that we would have to do the testing using half the class and another half. So there are downsides to it, but I think the, the, the pluses outweigh the, the cons. And then my other question was, is, is um, how are classes being selected? So it's not like the entire eighth grade, it would be just... No, it's two classes at particular grade levels in particular schools. And um, I um, saw a teleconference we were on last week with the technology director and um, uh, a couple other administrators. And what they said was the department would be sending out further directions directly to principals as to how they can select those classes because it needs to be random. So we don't have the information as to how to select yet. Although it's pretty clear if you have a school that only has two fourth grades and we're testing fourth grades, I bet it's those two fourth grades. But obviously it would be different in some high school classes, et cetera. Any uh, other questions or comments about the superintendent's report? Okay, hearing none, we'll now move on to an update on the uh, superintendent search. And I believe so, Ms. Pick will be delivering that. I'm pleased to say that after months of trying to get um, the screening committee off the ground, that we had our first meeting um, uh, last night. The mayor read off the committee. We are a member, uh, we are a 12 member committee this time. Um, we're being facilitated by Joe Wood from NASDAQ, as we were last time. In your packet, you received the timeline. So the um, 12 committee members are going to be working very hard. Don't try to distract them between now and Monday, because that's when our next meeting is. We're, we're juggling time around all the open houses that are happening right now. This is a different, a different season than we've done this before. Um, 
we have uh, 16 final applicants for the position. And don't ask them any more information than that because they've all signed their confidentiality agreements and they can't be telling you more. Um, our hope is to be interviewing um, not next week but the week after um, and being able to forward names for finalists to the school committee at the October 10th meeting. Okay. Are there any questions from school committee members about the process? Sorry. Um, you, you mentioned that you had 16 final applicants, and I just wanted you to uh, expand on that just a little bit to explain how those happen to be five. That's not all the applications that we received. I actually don't know that there were many more than that. Um, NESDEC has done just a very, very preliminary um, vet pre-vetting process just to make sure that people yeah, have people the qualifications uh, the most basic of the credentials that they have to have like that. Okay. Um, when we um, um, ask if when we ask candidates to come for semi-finalist interviews they will begin to do more vetting and then certainly before anybody comes before the full committee they will have already gone through a more much more thorough vetting process by NOSDUC. Mr. Bourne I was just, I mean, talking about the applicant pool, how, how was the decision made to um, do a search for a superintendent for January instead of the following September when it seems like there'd be more people to choose from? I did, after speaking with you about that, I, I did speak to Joe Wood at length about that. Uh -huh. And he really felt that um, since we had put this out in the beginning and we did have candidates come forward who were right. interested, and even after we were delayed, those candidates were still interested. Uh -huh. He thought that there was um, no no harm to the district in trying to do the search now. Um, he he thought that there were some um, viable candidates in there that we sh that we might not want to um, delay the process for. Um, and if we should need to go out again, then then we still have the option to do that. And he didn't think that it would hurt our reputation to do that one time. Okay. I mean, I guess this is an issue of what it means for the search committee. If I mean have them on the hook for another and I mean no offense to Joe but he's probably got an interest in not having to deal with the search when it's prime time to be doing another search right he also said that if we wait till the spring then we are competing with many more districts um, uh, who may be able to afford a higher salary than we could uh, um, and that he didn't think it was a disadvantage he said there are people who leave their positions all the time uh, um, and while it's not a gigantic pool, that uh, it, you know, it is a significant enough number to consider. Right. Good. Any other uh, questions or comments about that process? Okay. Um, hearing none, we'll continue on in the agenda. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is a scheduled executive session that will happen in the JFK Principals Conference Room uh, under Mass General Law Open Meeting Law for the approval of the executive session minutes of July 11th, 2013 and under Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining uh, with, uh, with NACE. Um, so I would ask for a motion now to move into executive session uh, for those purposes. So moved. Second. Is there a second? Okay. I will ask the clerk to call uh, a roll call vote uh, with an affirmative vote uh, to move in, required for us to move into uh, executive session. Mr. Alvin Yes. 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 So that motion carries. I need to announce to the public that we will be now moving into executive session, uh, and we're doing so because to hold this discussion in an open uh, meeting uh, could uh, ne negatively impact the city's uh, bargaining uh, position uh, with regard to that. I also need to let you know that we will be coming back from executive session uh, into open session. We will not be adjourning um, from, uh, from the executive session. So we'll now move into the conference room. Ready to continue?
Welcome back to the uh, September 12th, 2013 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Uh, we have just uh, reconvened an open session after having an executive session. Uh, and the next item of business on the agenda uh, is the ratification vote of, of a 2013-2016 uh, collective bargaining agreement uh, for the following bargaining units, uh, teachers, administrators, educational support professionals, clericals, cafeteria, and custodial workers as part of the Northampton Association of School Employees. Uh, and I will um, entertain a motion on that uh, from the chair of the bargaining committee. Yes, I would move that the school committee ratify the memorandum of agreement that has presented to it that will end agreements currently in force and to be extended to the year 2016 with the Northampton Association of School Employees. Second that motion. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded, and then I would um, open the floor for uh, comments from our, I guess, beginning with our bargaining committee members. So I just want to say for, for the record that I am incredibly proud of the work that the um, school committee and the um, unions did together. This is the first time that we have ever had a negotiation with no legal representation at the table. This was a truly collaborative effort between um, the school committee and the, um, the six unions. And um, I thank um, the president of NACE for being um, open to the idea. I think she thought we were crazy when we first brought it up. Um, but for being open to it and bringing it to her constituency and for um, for the work that um, that the entire um, union represent representatives at the table that there were usually 13 to 15 of them at the table and there were the, the two of us and it was not stressful it was not acrimonious it was not difficult it was truly truly um, um, precedent setting um, collaborative work and I just I'm really proud to have been a part of it um, I'm happy that we're able to bring a three-year contract um, to the committee for ratification. And I also want to thank the president of the association, Sharon Carlson, and all of the members of their bargaining team. Um, it was it was not always, or it was never very difficult, but I think there were times when we disagreed and both sides um, have important interests to protect. But I, I think that both sides never lost sight of what the goal is, which is the education of students in Northampton. And I think that we have um, an amazing um, staff and employees who work within the system, um, custodians, clerical workers, teachers, ESPs, um, administrators, um, who all do their best to make sure that, that students are served and that the community um, can be proud of the schools that we have in the city. So I want, to, I want to thank them. I really think it was a, um, a great effort on their part to always, while representing their interest, to see the, the bigger goal. Are there any other comments? Mr. Zahowski. I need to, uh, again, applaud the efforts of both the school committee, the bargaining team, and uh, all those involved who worked tirelessly and um, many, many hours to bring this to fruition. and. Um, I, I too am very pleased with, with the outcome, the longevity of the contract and the stability it's going to give all of us as uh, school committee members as we work through the budget seasons in the next few years and for teachers to know year to year coming back um, that um, they're being recognized and, and taken care of in, in the future. So I think it's wonderful. Mr. Mayor, I have one. I was trying to take off all the units from memory, and I, I knew I left out one because I was counting up, and I, the cafeteria workers um, <laughs> should not be forgotten because they, they, do, they do make a big difference for our kids every day. So. And as Mr. Meyer brought that up, um, as I have a family member in my household who will be a beneficiary of this new contract, I will recuse myself from the vote uh, for that purpose. Okay. Are there any other comments? Um, and before we vote, I too want to just uh, commend uh, uh, the, the school committee and uh, President Carlson and the members of her bargaining team. Um, this is now uh, a second 
long-term contract that that one of our city units has reached and I think that's a positive sign in terms of uh, especially trying to budget sustainably over a longer period of time and not being in a constant state of bargaining giving the city stability uh, a sense of stability um, as well as obviously our employees and their families a sense of stability over a longer period of time and I I, I um, I know we're working with our other bargaining units on the city side to also try to reach these longer term agreements so that we can have that stability going forward and fit within a larger plan around our budget over the next several years. So um, this, is, uh, this is an excellent development. Any other uh, comments? I just want to say that I just really respect the collaborative process that went through um, and that it was very respectful from both and, and um, I just want to say I appreciate that it was based on collaboration both from the school committee members and from Sharon Carlson and the educators. Okay. Any other comments? Um, hearing none, uh, I will then um, call the question and ask, uh, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on this. Mr. Gavin Meyer? Yes. Ms. Yes. 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 Okay. So the motion carries. Uh, so that is adopted. Okay. Uh, our only other items remaining on the agenda. Uh, we have some future business and meeting dates. Um, the uh, superintendent, uh, uh, ad hoc superintendent search subcommittee um, uh, is listed here as meeting on September 16th at 6 p.m. at JFK. Uh, and then our regular next regular school committee meeting on October 10th um, at 7.15 here at JFK. And I would now- Move to adjourn. Seconded. All those in, oh, and I have been, just before we vote on that, uh, I know this isn't a debatable motion, but uh, the business manager has asked me to remind you, please not to leave. There's a giant stack of all those contracts we approved that he needs signatures on. So. We also need signatures on the memorandum. And we need signatures on the memorandum of agreement, as, uh, of understanding as well. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, the meeting is adjourned.